Well, the second story is dates not from 406 BCE, but from just over about, well, 50 years ago, really, with um, the presidency of John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis of uh, October 1962, when Kennedy decided that he should have nuclear command and control options with them at all times. So command and control basically just means that you, um, in battle or in military, it means that that's where you're uh, in charge. It is, it is the people it is the people who are in charge, not just not usually just one person. Um, and it's also where, whoops, jeez, careful with the T there, this is valuable stuff. Good Lord, don't lose a drop of tea. Um, well, that's a real, <laughs> that's a real crime. Um, yeah, so command and control, they just called called C2 because it's two Cs, right, command and control. And they're going to go on adding to these Cs so that by the time we get to the end of the course, there will be four, four? There will be four. <laughs> there will be four Cs uh, instead of uh, two. But uh, command and control means that basically you um, can, from wherever you are, both command and control the forces that are underneath you. Uh, okay, so you're the boss. You're the military boss. And what specifically Kennedy wants is um, what is a, what eventually comes to be called the football. And um, Eisenhower had something similar to this, but it was really under Kennedy um, during this Cuban Missile Crisis that um, the football was created. Now, in movies, it's made to look as though uh, the football is some kind of magical briefcase that has an actual little launch um, sort of set of buttons in it, and you know, pop open this briefcase and you know, do a hand scan or it scans your eye to confirm who you are and you have to answer questions and then you can punch a bunch of buttons and launch missiles. It's like, <laughs> that's not really actually at all how it works. The football is never far from the president and I'll show you some pictures of it here. And it's carried by someone who is a major or higher in rank. So you can imagine being tasked with this job where your whole job is to be near the president all the time, basically. As long as you're on duty, you're near the president. And you, that doesn't mean you're listening. You, you, you won't be allowed in to, like, if they're having a meeting in the Oval Office, you're not going to be allowed in. You just have to be within 12 feet, basically, of the president, roughly. Um, and so you have to be Im immediately to hand. And you are not to wander. I mean, you are not allowed to wander around and so on. And your job is to have this attache case uh, chained to your wrist. Um, and that is it, basically. You follow the president. And should there come a time when the president needs you, it's probably because it's the end of the world. So what a job to have, right? Inside the football, inside the football, is a list of possible commands for nuclear options. Sometimes it's called a menu. Uh, sometimes it's described as a menu. And in other words, you would look down this list and it would say, um, well, the Joint Chiefs are recommending a tactical nuclear strike. And you're like, okay, what do we got? So you look under tactical nuclear strike and it's like, here are some a bunch of possibilities. This is the one we re recommend the most and so on. So it has the most up-to-date, best advice from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, basically, with all the, all the arms of the military, right? The Air Force and the Navy and the Naval Air Force and the, uh, uh, so, okay, all the other, and the intelligence agencies and, okay. And, uh, and it goes from a tactical nuclear strike, which is the smallest, uh, using a th what is called a theater weapon, which means that um, it probably is not going to kill the world right off, like it would be a small weapon, a small, small nuclear weapon, which might have a yield of, I don't know, you know, a few kilotons maybe, as opposed to megatons. Um, the megaton devices are, 
they're just so massive. It's like, I mean, a few a few of those, and it's game over for the planet, with a very few exception of, you know, some living things. Um, but there would be, it would be a nuclear winter. It would be bad. Um, so from a tactical nuclear strike, which is the smallest thing you can sort of imagine with nuclear weapons, to a full-out uh, MAD, as it's called, missile exchange. MAD is mutually assured destruction, where I launch all my missiles, you launch all your missiles, and we're mutually assured to destroy each other. And it's this destruction, it's this capability of destruction, which suggests that we won't engage in a nuclear war, because everybody knows that nobody will survive it, so nobody starts one. That's the thinking, right? So there is also in it a phone, verification codes, um, and other similar paperwork. So it's really just paperwork, uh, mostly. The phone is, is obviously going to be a one-time use uh, as protected, encrypted, you know, like it's going to have, like, you, you, if this number rings somewhere in the command bunker, it means there is going to be some serious trouble. And as I say, it's probably, probably likely to be the last sort of couple of hours of life on the planet when this kind of thing happens. The president carries uh, usually a key piece of the exchange uh, with him. And this piece changes every day. And every day um, he is given what is called in the morning. And, and again, I don't know where the military comes up with this stuff. It's like they just, you know, they can't just call something by its name. It's like, no, they got to give it this sort of, you know, flaky, hey, you know, like this is a cool name for it, the bro name for it. Anyway, he, he carries what is called the biscuit. And the biscuit is a credit card, basically, um, that has, that is a one-time cover, basically, or a one-time, what's, it basically, it, it comes, it's encoded with what is called a one-time pad. And a one-time pad is a method of encoding where it's the most, it is the most, it is the safest form of encryption where you have to have the other person's piece of the code to know your piece of the code. Basically, you must have it. And you have to know what day it is. You have to know what code, what the code book is. And it's, it's very, very hard to break. <clears throat> it's, e it's harder to break than uh, even a very fancy, say, I don't know, 256K encryption. It's like, yeah, you know, they're like a one-time pad. It's like 97,000 K. It's just massive encoding. So that's what's on this card. And the card changes every day because it, each day there's a new pad. That's the point about a one-time pad. You'd use, you can use it once and you dispose of it, never to be used again. So you have to carry, <clears throat> you, the president, are given this card to carry. Um... And on it has these identification codes. The identification codes identify who you are, <clears throat> and it also identifies <clears throat> the, um, it gives you permission basically to launch missiles as the President of the United States. Okay. The case itself, which I'll show you pictures of here, is called a Zero Halliburton case. And now this is ironically no connection to the company Halliburton, which is, <laughs> it's a, it seems a bit fishy to me, but anyway, it's just called a Halliburton case. And so it's this, as you can see, this metal exterior, and inside it um, is a black leather bag or a, a leather bag, uh, apparently. I mean, you know, people have talked about this stuff, but they, they... So uh, here are some pictures of it. If the president decides to make a nuclear strike, he can do it then from wherever he is, as long as the football's nearby, right? because the major has got to be nearby with this <coughs> thing chained to his wrist. And Collins is building on these two stories. She takes these two stories and she says, let's put them together. Let's imagine that the person carrying the football isn't carrying a football. Let's imagine that the football is a little girl and that she has inside her the biscuit so that if you want to go to war, nuclear war, you got to kill this little girl and get the codes out of her body. And then you can have a nuclear war, right? And like most science fiction, which goes a couple of steps further on and imagines, um, you know, 
well, let's just turn this up a few notches because what are we talking about here? You know, I mean, if a, if a major, if you've got a task a major with walking around like this, and it's very tough duty, I gather, um, I read accounts of people who have done this, and they'll say, you know, it was the toughest duty I ever had. I mean, these are senior military people. Well, relatively. The majors. Whoops! Okay, geez. And, um, and they'll say, you know, I, I spent a year, you know, living very tense. Um, but if you were, so with science fiction, it's like, let's take this idea and really just crank it right up so that it is at the utmost to just, uh, you know, just turn up the gears here. Um, and that specifically to give it to a child and a girl child, which, as I've mentioned before, is sort of like the, uh, in the West anyway, is the <clears throat> most taboo uh, of this of the sacred objects, apart from say a, a, a babe in arms, you know, a, a child, a, a, a child that's like a, a one year old, you know, that kind of thing, a ba a, a, a baby, you know. Um, and the girl is knowing in the case of Colin's story. She says, they think it's all a trick, but I don't know what my job is really about. This is on page 79. In other words, she has agreed to be a sacrifice. She is like Agamemnon's daughter. And that's why the story is called Iphigenia, right? There's a myth too, and Dalton Trumbull uses this in his novel, Johnny Got His Gun, which was uh, 1939, just before the war. Um, that the Carthaginians um, uh, had in their ar had in armories, and um, that they put a slave that they they chained a slave um, one arm to the wall and one arm to a door, and so the slave was chained basically across a doorway opening, a, a, a big stone door. And um, <clears throat> to get into the armory, the king and the king, it had to be the king. It couldn't be somebody else. He couldn't say, you know, hey, uh, soldier buddy, go, go in, uh, you know. The slave had to be killed, had to be cut in two um, by the king. So the king, before he could go to war, had to cut through the body of a living man. And as I say, it couldn't, the, the duty could not be handed off. It had to be done by the king. Okay, so Colin sort of reoffers this idea of a sacrifice. If the president wants to go to war, uh, which is going to make human life impossible, probably on the planet, uh, he will first have to take a life. And not just any life, but the life of this girl child, right? Well, why not? Why shouldn't, say, President Trump, uh, should he decide to go to war? or have a fight with North Korea, um, have to sacrifice his daughter, let's say, before he goes to war. Um, President Bush had two daughters, presumably still has them. Uh, why shouldn't he have had to kill one of them before going to war in Iraq? Once One to be sacrificed for the war in Iraq, and one to be sacrificed for the war in Afghanistan. Why not? Um, and if you're upset that they're girls, it's like, okay, kill boys. I'm okay with that, you know, as long as they're children. Because um, it's one thing to kill a man uh, who, the, I mean, the sort of the possibility is going to multiply, you know, or it could be, you could come up with any number of ideas, and, and people sort of do in these, yeah. There, there, there's lots of like this, this, this is not an unheard of story, but it's children, or it's people who have not yet had a chance to live their lives. Is the, you know, to, okay, to experience, uh, you know, what it is to what it is to live. Both, I mean, Bush seemed to only gain by the war. His children didn't go, um, and most of the children of men and women who voted for the two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, of them all, uh, one volunteered to go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan. 
So as our sacrifice says in the story, she trusts the president, although he's always sad when he's looking at her, and we'll come back to that. But she's, uh, she's, she's unhappy about the military. <laughs> she says, mainly because I don't like the way they look at me on page 82. So the two assumptions here is the president is sad because he knows that he's going to have to kill her. It's going to have to happen. And the second assumption is the military is bad news because she's disposable. They just don't care. They're like, yeah, kill her. After all, when has the military shown compassion to its soldiers or veterans? Except, of course, to say once they're dead, it's like, here's a medal. It's like, well, that's easy. right? I mean, <laughs> it's relatively meaningless to give a dead person a medal. Um, I guess it's good for the family. I don't know. I don't... I guess I suppose... I don't know. So this idea of sacrifice persists in our text today. Okay. <clears throat>